Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Singing a joyful song to God. 
please join me in the call to worship. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. We come to worship you today. Let us confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, I believe in God, your Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, but the third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he shall come to judge the wicked and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the, the communion of saints, the, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. got the opening prayer so we'll do that and then you can sit down <laughs> gracious God bless us today with the sure and powerful presence of the Holy Spirit help us to put away any thought but thoughts of you of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the sweet breath of the Holy Spirit in Christ's name Amen. Amen. now please be seated This time of confession gives us an opportunity to slow down for a moment, to look inside ourselves, to see what is stirring inside of us, and to watch for movement of the Spirit. Let us come to God with our prayers, first reading together, and then in a time of silence. Loving God, we want so many things, we seek so many things, many things clamor for our attention. In the middle of all those conflicting claims, we confess that we can easily forget to watch for you, the love of Christ, and the movement of the Holy Spirit. Please forgive us, quiet us, and call us to your heart. <clears throat> Amen. Jesus loves you, forgives you, embraces you, and if you do not believe that, then look to the cross where Jesus died for you. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Lord and the Bible tells us so and we are so thankful, thankful that someone a long time ago probably told us about this love that comes to us through Jesus Christ. We also are thankful for the words of Holy Scripture, the Bible, that tell us that. And so send your spirit to us that we would hear today what you would have us hear. In Jesus' name we pray and ask this. Amen. All right, our Old Testament lesson today is from Micah. Micah was a country boy come to town. He went to the nation Israel in a difficult time in the life of the nation Israel. He was called to be a prophet. He was given words of judgment. He was given words of punishment. And he was given words of hope. The most, he was also given words of requirement. And the most famous text from Micah, of course, is that what does the Lord require of you but to 
do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God, which are beautiful, beautiful, and important words. Those are not our words for today. However, just for every day, just for every day. Today, I have one verse from Micah chapter 7 that has much to do with the New Testament lesson and with the, with the course of what we shall be visiting about together um, in terms of a great spiritual discipline that we are going to talk about today with great seriousness. I want you to read this verse behind me in phrases, if you will, and let the words just sink down into your souls. The verse is Micah chapter 7, verse 7. Would you repeat after me, please? But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Savior. My God will hear me. One more time. Let's do that again. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Savior. My God will hear me. The word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together the hymn 324. Please stand. in that hymn I've sung a hundred times. I love the Gospel of Mark because it is filled with movement and energy and Jesus and his disciples in the Gospel of Mark. I mean, they don't even do the birth stories in the Gospel of Mark. They get right to Jesus moving, declaring the kingdom of God is at hand. They move. He heals. He teaches. He mixes it up with the Pharisees and scribes. Three times he foretells his death. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be killed. And on the third day, rise again. He's really got them moving. They keep things moving moving, moving in the Gospel of Mark and then all of a sudden stop at Mark 13. Things slow down a little bit or a lot. And he stops them and he says, he, he takes his disciples and he points to a fig tree and he says, I'm going to slow everything down now and tell you to watch the fig tree. 
learn the lesson. Now this chapter 13 is set in an apocalyptic chapter where we see Jesus say, hey, one day there are going to be signs like the moon is going to turn to blood and the stars will fall from the sky and all of this upheaval is going to happen. And then he says, and I want you to watch for that, but you're not going to know when the time comes. And we need to tell that to some of the people that are always saying, let's all know that it's coming tomorrow. He says, not, not the sun. I don't even know. Only the Father. But he tells the disciples a beautiful and important and life-giving word that we are going to linger and chew on a little bit together today. So, let's read together from the chapter 13 of Mark at verse 28. Listen for a word from God. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gate. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his own work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Watch. Therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I went to a covered dish meal one night in a church in Austin, Texas, and we had our meal, and then they brought our little dessert cups, strawberry, vanilla, chocolate with a little spoon that goes with it. We started eating our little ice cream there when the woman to my right said, Oh, I'm so glad they got Bluebell ice cream. It is the best ice cream in the whole world. And her husband kind of laughed and said, Better than Baskin and Robbins? N yes, it is the best ice cream in the whole world. It's the creamiest ice cream in the whole world. And the woman to my left says, Well, obviously you have never eaten Briar's praline and cream ice cream. It is so creamy and it is so wonderful. And she says, Well, it might be okay, but it's nothing like Bluebell ice cream. And then she says, You just aren't paying attention. You don't know about creaminess of ice cream. And it went on. It was like I was at a tennis match. These faithful people back and forth. And one of them looked at me and said, what do you think? And I started to say seal test, but I just kept my mouth closed. I'm just like, no, I am not getting into this. It was wild, faithful, wonderful people at a covered dish supper in a church one night in a fury over ice cream. We laugh. But what is that about? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> What is that about? I'll tell you what it's about. It's about lists. It's about lists that we, all of us, I think all of us, carry around in our heads. And we use those lists to judge, critique, evaluate, compare, grade, all of those things. We live in that kind of culture, do we not? We do. It's an evaluative, judging culture that we live and we want to get things right. And we know what is right because this list that is made up of our experiences, our culture, our learning, our education, our mama, our daddy, our grandmama, our granddaddy, all of those things that we've lined up, it's not bad. 
It is just something that we must be aware of because it's in play all the time. I got list. You got list. All God's children got list. I got list. One of those that's high on the top of my list is be on time. I was teethed on it. My daddy was a high school principal. He didn't start graduation at 6.55 or 7.05 if it was 7 o'clock. We were starting graduation at 7 o'clock be on time. So what happens? I'm sitting up in a balcony at a church one time. It's 11 o'clock. Where's pastor? Five after 11. No pastor. I'm thinking something must be wrong. Eight after 11. He strolls out. No apology. No nothing. I'm enraged. I can be going to somebody's home for a little home visit. Nothing big. I realize I'm going to be a little late. My blood pressure goes up. I get a little bit anxious. I am not delivering a life-saving vaccine. I am simply going to visit someone, but it's on my list, and it's high up on my list. I mustn't fail my father. This lady, I don't know. She's from Texas. Everything in Texas is better, and that's high up on her list. Or this woman who was a home ec teacher, I guess, knows everything there is to know. Thank you very much about food and cooking and stuff. We have this list. They're not bad. They just are. We live in a culture, as I said, that's evaluative, linear, scientific, move from this to that, get it done, move about, take charge, take control, let's move, shall we? That is not what Jesus said. Here's what Jesus said. Here's what that list making. They're, they're like this. Jesus instead says to his disciples and to us a beautiful word. Watch. Now that doesn't mean you don't ever do anything or that you don't move around in the world. It means that while you are doing that, you are watching. You are watching what's going on inside here and you are watching what's going on out there in the world, particularly for the movement of the Holy Spirit. This isn't the only place that Jesus says this. Jesus says clearly, judge not, lest you be judged. Well, you want to discern, don't you? We're not really judging. We're just discerning. You know, we're not really judging. We're just having a, an opinion. We're just sharing our opinion, aren't we? <laughs> we're judge not, he says. Oh, and in the beautiful uh, Sermon on the Mount that he preaches, if you look at that, that is full of this kind of gentleness. Blessed are the poor in spirit, not the people that know everything about everything, the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. That doesn't mean you have bad self-esteem. It means that you're humble before God, that you look at the world and you follow the leading of the Spirit. Now, why would I bring that up this Sunday? Why? Because you have a new pastor coming. You have a new pastor coming and you have a list in your head. And over the time that you're going to be together, those things are going to come together. You have in your head a list about the way a pastor is supposed to be. You have in your head the way they look, the way they talk. There's that pastor you had 20 years ago, and they, in your memory, were perfect. <laughs> perfect. You might have forgotten a few things. And nobody's perfect. The way that they preach. People, preachers preach all different kinds of ways. On your list, you have some ways that they preach better than others. There's expository preaching. There's teaching preaching. There's narrative preaching. Most pastors use a variety of that over a period of time in their lives. It's different. You've got it. You know what the perfect sermon would sound like, don't you? Oh, I'm pointing my finger. I should stop that. It's important. 
How should they do their pastoral care? How should they dress? How should they talk? How should they act? Is it bad to have a list? No. Do you need to know what it is? <laughs> yes. Because you've got a new pastor coming and you have a list. <laughs> And during, especially in the early days, those two things are going to bump into each other. I can't stress this enough. Maybe you think I already have. But the point of this is Jesus said to us, we need to watch. We need to watch the movement that's inside ourselves and we need to watch the movement that's out there in the world so that when the Holy Spirit moves, we don't miss it because we're busy looking at something else. Four times in that passage, Jesus said it. I want to go back to those again. Take heed. Watch. For you do not know when the time will come. You don't know when the Lord will show up. And I don't mean in clouds of glory. I mean into your own life. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home. Each with his own work. He puts him in charge and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Watch, therefore, because you don't know when this is going to happen. The Lord can move any time, even here. You know, it can happen. And what I say, Jesus says, I say to you all, learn the lesson of the fig tree. Watch. I've got to get a glass of water. I'm so sorry. Excuse me. The church I was in in North Carolina... When I went there, they said, wink, wink, that they were about 175 members. Well, I never met all of them, but they said they were 175. They also said they had a few little financial problems. They were flat broke. The Presbytery had bailed them out $13,000 a year before. People in that dear congregation were taking months I'll take December, you take January, February to pay the utilities off. That's how bad off they were. I met with my new little uh, administrative assistant. She said, I'm doing an order at Office Depot. I said, no, you're not. You are not ordering those paper clips because we can't afford it. So we got up and ran around the church and collected all those paper clips that we have in drawers because we weren't ordering any paper clips. They didn't really mention that it was that bad. But anyway, we had a lot of work to do together. And the turning point in that church really was when we had a session retreat. And we met together and we did all of our plans. You have to do your plans, of course. We worked hard on it. We prayed over it. But the turning point really came that year when that session committed together to make a covenant that what we were really going to do was watch the movement of the Holy Spirit. That we were going to watch what the Holy Spirit was doing out in the community around us and within our own community. And when we saw that Spirit move, we were going to run over there and blow on it as fast as we could. And when those new members started coming and we were blessed with 50 new members year over year over year over year and that church was going and shuffling and, and moving, when we saw our new members come and we saw what they were interested in and where the Lord was leading them, we went over there, you go, and we will give you some paper clips to help you accomplish that. We will. We will help you do what the Lord is calling you to do. And it burst out. And I'm never seen anything like it and I didn't do it. I just rejoiced and it went, yeah, look at the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's moving. Things we would never have thought of. That's why this is important. This one word, watch, can change this church. It can change your life. It really can. I can't stress it enough. I want to tell you one more thing to give you an example of the power of this spiritual discipline. In spirituality, it's called bear attention. Just watching. Not judging. Not evaluating. The Spirit will help you know when the time to move comes. 
I did a hospital visit one day in Austin, Texas in one of those big downtown hospitals. It rained, of course, that afternoon. The traffic was terrible. I got to the parking garage. I couldn't find a parking place. Up, up, up as if to heaven I went until I found one on the very top. I moved to the elevator. Down, down, down I went. I went to the desk. They said, John is in 15th floor, whatever it was. John was a young man who was dying of AIDS. And this was in those days when we knew very little about AIDS and it was frightening and terrible and I had visited with him a lot. And as I went by the gift shop, I glanced in there and there was a Tweety Bird balloon, big old Tweety Bird balloon. And I thought, well, this doesn't seem very pastoral, but the man loves cartoons, <laughs> young man. Sometimes I'd watch cartoons with him when I went to see him and he didn't feel well. So I said, well, I'll get a Tweety Bird. So I got this big Tweety Bird balloon, wrestled it into the elevator, and away I go. I get off at that floor, I see the nurse at the station, there are big signs checking with the, at the desk. I start moving toward the desk where there is a woman who sees me, but in this elaborate slow turn, turns to face the screen away from me. So I, I stood, stood there a minute, and then finally I said, excuse me, excuse me. And this lady, in the most exaggerated slow motion you've ever seen, turns around, puts a gaze on me. If I could shoot you and avoid prosecution, I would. <laughs> she looks at me and says, what? And I said, I need to see John. No, no, no. She said, you need to see Nurse Susan. And wheels around again. I said, excuse me. Excuse me. Wheels around, looks at me like you're a flea on a dog's back, and says, I said, who is Nurse Susan? And she says, there. I spin around and Nurse Susan is walking through a door that says personnel only. So I decided, because I was big, just getting into the spiritual discipline of watch. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to stand here and watch. And I did. And I first watched all that anger <laughs> that was rising up in me. I felt my back. It didn't feel good that day. I looked to my left and saw three rooms with people in them. And they were alone. And they were sick. Oh, they looked so sick and so alone. Tweety bounced off my head. I, I, I felt how stupid I felt standing there holding Tweety Bird over life and death. I looked up and uh, Aunt, Miss Nurse Susan came out of that room and said, I need a witness, I need a witness. And her face was lined with Tiredness. There must have been somebody in terrible pain in that room. I even managed to glance at the young woman at the desk. And I could see that she was tired. And I reduced her crime to a misdemeanor. <laughs> I looked up and there was an African American gentleman coming down the hall pushing that IV pole and with the other hand holding those stupid hospital robes in the back. And he came down and he said, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, like our Lord cried from the cross, I'm thirsty. And this nurse saunters over to him, help him down the hall. And I felt a wave of irritation at her for being so nonchalant about it. And you know, I was a different person by the end of that than I was the person that stepped off of that elevator. Because as much as it was possible or is possible for us to do, I guess, for just a second there, I think I was able to watch with the eyes of Christ instead of my own eyes. Just in watching, and I can still see that gentleman coming down the hall saying, I'm thirsty. 
the Holy Spirit eventually said, pray for them. And so for the rest of that 15 minutes, I just stood there and prayed for the old man and for the John and for the three people in those beds. Jesus said to us today in this scripture, from the fig tree learn its lesson. Watch. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God of all grace, through Jesus Christ you have called us to be watchful and so we watch more news that shows us innocence caught in war and we watch more press conferences with weeping family members standing near a grocery store or a church. And we watch ourselves shake our heads in sadness without seeking or knowing a new way. And we watch brave men and women in our police forces showing up again and again and again to protect us from each other. And sometimes we don't even thank them. We watch your church in the world sparkling in its witness and we watch your church tepid and tentative failing to engage within our shifting cultures. Gracious God, through faith, we know that your spirit is moving and working and stirring. Help us see where that is and bless us with hearts and eyes and courage to follow where that spirit is leading us. Bless those today who are ill, recovering from surgeries, confused and lost and lonely. Bless those who are pushing IV poles down hospital corridors and those who have gotten dreadful diagnoses and those who are alone and sick or in a nursing home. And pour out your Holy Spirit on this congregation here called First Presbyterian Church, Lord, and strengthen them with power and hope in this coming time that they have together. We are asking and seeking a pouring out of your Spirit and then the willingness to step back enough inside to watch and see what it is you would have them do, what it is you would have them see, what it is you would have them change or embrace. And we pray for their new pastor and her family as they prepare to come and be here and be among you. And we ask all of these things in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to bring the gifts to the Lord, to return to the Lord just a little bit of all the many things that have been given to us. Let us bring our tithes and offerings. <coughs>
precious God, we pray that you would accept these gifts and use them also to shape us into lives who love mercy and kindness, that we would walk humbly with you, giving you not just our financial gifts, but also loving God our lives. In the name of Christ, amen.